Hi, Christian. Hope you're feeling better. Tell you what, we're going to be looking right here at uh, 15.1, beginning a brand new unit. We're dealing right now with surfaces. So, you know, z is equal to a function of f of x and y. Maybe this is a paraboloid. Uh, you know, you can see this uh, surface coming around here. We could have a specified region on the x, y axis. And, uh, you know, that's what we've got right here. Maybe your x's are between a and b and your y's. Our, and you can see we've written that off to the side here. Y is between C and D. And uh, you can see on the picture, we've got the C and the D and the A and the B. And, uh, you know, we very well could say, well, look, we've got this surface here. I wonder what the volume bounded, assuming that Z is always a, a positive uh, function, that these Z values are always greater than or equal to zero. You might wonder what that volume might be. Our goal is to find that volume. Today, we're just going to be estimating that volume. We're not going to find it exactly. Uh, tomorrow and you know the rest of the week, we're going to really get into saying, okay, let's do better than just doing an estimate. Uh, but look, last year, we worked with rectangle approximations. We formed a Riemann sum and you know, we were even mentioning before we started the video how, you know, you'd go from A to B and it, you might have an R RAM or an L RAM or an M RAM and so forth. And uh, you could add up all these areas of rectangles and you could find an estimate for the area bound by the curve and the X axis. And, you know, then we turned that into a summation and we said, let's say that we approach an infinite number of rectangles. We looked at that Riemann sum. What are we going to do today? Well, tell you what, we're going to take our region R that we just saw right here, and we're going to say, if you've got a region R, let's go ahead and do uh, some sub-intervals. Break that region into sub-rectangles. And uh, here's something that is so very, very important for you to take note of. You could say, how do we move with X? Delta X, you know, X went from B to A. We're going to say B minus A, but this year we're going to say X is broken into M subintervals. M subintervals. Uh, in other words, it's as if we've got M, you know, little uh, sub uh, intervals just down here, uh, but simultaneously our delta Y would be D minus C all over N. We're going to break that into n subintervals. What happens is all of a sudden that region R is turned into a rectangular grid. So that big region R right now is turned into all these little tiny rectangles. And we're going to say in any one of those sub uh, rectangles, choose an arbitrary point inside. That's the x i, j star, y, i, j star. Just pick an arbitrary point in there, and that will determine how tall we should go to get a height of a rectangular prism. We're going to be building little rectangular prisms. Each one of these little rectangles here, we're going to give a height to. And by the way, guys, going back to your geometry days, the volume of a rectangular prism, what do you think the, the uh, formula is for it? Uh, length times width times height. Or you could say the area of the base times the height. That's going to be something very similar. And you could say, well, you know, all I have to do is multiply delta x times delta y here to get that. Uh, but you can see they're setting up a, a Riemann sum uh, with a double use of sigma. And sometimes it's that double use of sigma that might be a little confusing to kids. They'll say, oh my gosh, look at that. Remember, M was referring to the X's and N was referring to the Y's. And sometimes kids look at this and they think, how in the world could a double sigma ever even be evaluated? How in the world would that ever happen? 
And, uh, you know, those of you who've worked with uh, computer programming, maybe this can even help you out. It's like a loop within a loop, so to speak. And uh, if you program, you know what I'm saying. You'd say, start off with i equals 1, and then go from j equals 1 all the way up to, to n. So what would happen is, here's your i equals 1, and then here would be your j equals 1, your j equals 2, your j equals 3, and, and so forth. Uh, you would go through that until you got up to j equals n. And then once you've gone through all of these n, then you'd go up to i equals 2. And then you'd start over. You'd start the j counter at 1 again. So if, if you've ever programmed with loops, like a loop within a loop, that's really what's happening. Now, ironically, we don't even need to talk through that for today's lesson. But I know sometimes kids look at that and they'd say, how in the world could that ever even be evaluated? And, and that's really how. Uh, now, look, like I'd said before, here's one little base subrectangle. And you could say, well, pick some height there, some height and it doesn't even matter which height you're going to have. At least you have a, an estimate there. Uh, maybe it's too big. Maybe it's too small. But bare minimum, you do have an estimate. Look, you do that all the time. And you get all these rectangular prisms, add up all their volumes, and you have an approximation for the volume that's bounded that we wanted to find up here. So I think the bigger question for kids today is, well, okay, how in the world would we be applying this, uh, you know, in this section? And let's take a look at a particular problem right here and see if we can work this out. It says, uh, estimate the volume of the solid below the paraboloid right here. I think immediately kids can get a little bit nervous thinking, oh, wow, do I need to graph that in this regard? Uh, you don't. You don't. Uh, just understand, just like when you look at the floor of this classroom, you can see all these little sub-rectangles, right? Just imagine up above, it's not like a flat ceiling, but it's almost like a tent or like a domed surface. And, and you'd say, well, I'd like to find the, the volume as we go above that. So, well, here's what you got to do. This right here is your X boundaries, and here are your Y boundaries. And uh, let's go ahead and begin to work that out. M equals N equals 2. So this is your A and your B. So delta X is going to be B minus A all over M. That's 2 minus 0 all over, well, M would equal 2. You could say, well, delta X would be a 1. I'm going to begin at 0. I'm going to move over 1. I'm going to move over another 1. There I go. Okay, uh, take a look at delta y. Delta y is d minus c all over n. Well, your c is 0, your d is 2, so that's 2 minus 0 all over. Again, we'd have a 2 here. You'd say, well, that's also a 1. Well, it doesn't take you too long to see the grid that's really taking place, guys. This is the grid that we're working with. Okay, we've got four bases of rectangular prisms designated. Okay, but then what? They're saying, oh, by the way, the sample points, remember, we need to find sample points to be able to work this out. They're the right corners of each subrectangle. The right corners of each subrectangle. Now, by the way, what's the uh, area of each one of these little subrectangles? One. You can see that every subrectangle is a one by one. So remember, we could say that the volume of a prism, like I said earlier, is the area of the base uh, times the height. So I'm going to have to do this four times. Uh, here we go with our first little corner here. I'm going to say the upper right corner would be the point one comma one. Uh, so, look, if this is my f function, maybe this is a great way to just begin writing this out. We're always going to have the area of the base 
times the height. So I'm going to say the area of the base is 1. What's your height? It's f of 1 comma 1. We'll work that out in just a moment. And then we could say, well, let's go over here to our next space. Remember how uh, those double sigmas were working. Maybe we'll go to our second rectangle here. And we could say, well, the area of the base is still a 1. But what's your upper right corner right now? It's going to be 1 comma 2. So I'm going to say, hey, there we go. We've got f of 1 comma 2. And I'm going to say plus. Well, now we can come down here to this little guy. And we can say, well, let's see. We've got an upper right corner right over here. You could say the base of that rectangle. I mean, the area of that a base of that prism is a 1. Now I'm going to say f of 2 comma 1. I'm going to have one more thing that I'm going to have to work out. And uh, this one you could even change colors just making it all jump out here. You'd say what about that last sub rectangle? Well, the base of that prism is 1. What's the height going to be determined by? f of 2 comma 2. These are x comma y's. And this is where we're going to plug these into f. So when I plug in a 1 and a 1, what we're really going to get is 16 minus 1 squared minus 2 times 1 squared. Uh, what does all that work out to, guys? 16 minus 1 minus 2 is 13. And then we could say, well, next we're going to say plug in a 1 and a 2. Well, you know, again, that's you know, pretty much saying 16 minus 1 squared minus 2 times 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. So that's a 16 minus 8 is 8. And then minus another one. I'm getting 7. Hopefully that's what you guys are getting. And then we could say, hey, now plug in x equals 2, y equals 1. We go 16 minus 2 squared minus 2 times 1 squared. Uh, 2 squared is a 4. Look at that. Minus 4 and minus 2, that's a negative 6. 16 minus 6, I'm getting 10. And finally, plug in a 2. Well, as you can see, lots of number crunching in today's lesson. Uh, you know, 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 is an 8. This is a 4. Negative 8 and negative 4 are negative 12. And 16 minus 12 would be a 4. So 13 plus 7 is 20. 20 plus 10 is 30. I'm getting an estimated volume of 34. We doing okay? So, guys, that's what we're doing so much of the day today. Now, as we move on to this next one, in the last problem, we used the upper right corner, uh, and, and that's fine. We could also use the midpoint rule, and that would be in each sub-rectangle, find the midpoint, and then work it out. Uh, so look, here's your A and B. Here's your C and D. You could say, well, delta X is going to be B minus A all over M. And M's, again, going to be a 2. So I'll go 2 minus 0 all over 2. My delta X is going to be a 1. How about delta Y? That's going to be C minus D all over N. Oh, be careful. This is 2 minus 1 all over 2. Right, your n's 2 there. Delta y is actually a half here, isn't it? We've got to be careful. It's not always going to be integers that we're going to be working with. So let's draw ourselves a little grid here. We can say, well, go with your x's. Here's 0. My delta x is a 1, so I'll go to 1. I'll go to 2. Look at your y's, though. You go to 1, but now you're going to go up to 1 and a half. And then you go up another half, and then you go up to two. Now, I kind of made a funny scale there uh, in that, you know, it looks like my tick marks aren't all uniform. But rest assured, guys, that you could still do this. That's fine. You still have four sub-rectangles that you're working with. You're still working with those four Dare I say, maybe what you most have to be careful about is finding the midpoints. Let's be careful. Help me. This point right here, right in the center,